Hello, everyone. Good morning. Nice to see you all, and it's really lovely to be here. My name's Jimmy Dodsworth, and I'm uh, one of the pastors at Gympie Community Church, pastoring the flock there. And, uh, oh, hello. Forgot about the upstairs there. Hey, Kev. Thank you so much for inviting me, by the way. Really appreciate it. Um, an interesting fact you should know about me is that I'm Kevin's long-lost twin brother. <laughs> we were born on the exact same day in 1987. So when we found that out, we were quite surprised. It was pretty cool. have another brother who was born on the other side of the world to me on the same day. Anyway, I really appreciate you guys inviting me here and um, having the opportunity to share. I love Kevin's heart for unity. I love Kevin's heart for the body of Christ and just his passion for Jesus and to see the lost found. And that's something that really stands out to me when I um, interact and talk with Kevin and just see him in action. Um, I really love that. And you've got a great man of God here among you. So you should be really, really thankful for that. And I hear as well that the Church of Christ is, is a really biblical church too. And that is really encouraging to hear as well, especially in this day and age. And I hope that as I preach just a little bit from the Word of God today, that you will be supernaturally transformed to become more like Jesus. That you will find that He is the most lovely person you've ever met, that you would even be renewed in your love for Jesus if you've lost that first love. I pray that you would open your heart to hear what He has to say to you today, not me. I want to start off by asking you all today, what would you say is the most important thing in life? Think about that. The most important thing in life. What would you say? You can call it out if you want. Health, salvation... Breathing, family. These all sound like pretty important things to me. Love. Striving to become more and more like Christ. These sound like pretty good things to me. I noticed that love was mentioned. That's a big one. But I think above all else, you think of all those important things in life. I think in the world, the most important thing and in this life is to know God. To know God. Not just know Him intellectually, but to know Him in a relationship. I think when we know the God who is love then we will naturally love him and love others. And that's what he calls us to do, right? But when it comes to knowing God, like I said, it's not about knowing about him. It's really knowing him. It's kind of like, well, it is. It's like the, the people that you know in your life, your closest family members, your spouse, your closest friends. You don't just tell people that you know them because you know a lot about them, but you know them because... You've experienced life with them and you have a relationship. It's an experiential relationship. Now, this might seem like I'm going a bit off track here, but I want us to take a look at John 3.16. I think most of us probably know what John 3.16 says. We could even probably repeat it out loud without looking at our Bibles. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever goes to church, whoever reads their Bible, whoever believes in him, that word is trust, entrust yourself to him. You will not perish, but you will have everlasting life, eternal life. Now, what exactly is eternal life? Have you ever thought about that? A lot of our kind of thinking in the church tends to look towards heaven. 
and being there for eternity. And that's only a small part of really what it's talking about. Do you think there's anywhere in the Bible, do you know of, that tells us what eternal life is? There is. There's a small scripture in John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus says this, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. That word know, it's a funny little word in the Greek called gnosko, and it means to experientially know. So what John 3.16 is basically saying, if I paraphrase it for you, is that whoever has faith in Jesus and trusts in him will not spiritually die, but will experientially know him. That means you'll be able to hear his voice and follow him constantly in the day to day. That means you'll experience times, even times of supernatural activity in your life. Maybe a healing. Maybe there's some of you here who have experienced that. Maybe another form of blessing that God has for you. Experiencing God is is not just coming to church on a Sunday. It's not just reading the Bible. It's not just singing these songs that we've just sung. It's not even just listening to a sermon. It's a daily relationship. As you walk with, with Jesus. Now, for some of you, maybe you've never really had that kind of relationship before. And, and I can totally understand and empathise with that. I've been there and I grew up in a Christian family. I went to church, I have been going to church my whole life. And when I was in high school, I started leading... Sunday school, the church, and the kids club. And when I graduated high school, I started leading the youth group. I started doing communion messages at church, <clears throat> leading the worship. I helped on the tech team. Shout out to you guys at the back. Mate, you're doing a great job. Thank you. I volunteered on the welcoming team. I was doing a lot of stuff for God. And after a while, I even started preaching at church and going to conferences. I organised outreach events, attended countless prayer meetings, watched countless Christian videos on YouTube. Who does that? I read countless Christian books, read the Bible constantly, memorised lots of scriptures, went on mission trips to Africa. But in all these things, I was just exhausted. So much stuff I was doing. And I knew something was still missing in my life. But it didn't make any sense to me. What could I be missing if I'm doing so much stuff for God? Until one day, I had a personal encounter with Jesus and experienced Him for myself. And he showed me this vision of my entire life in a movie reel. And through that vision, he spoke to me very clearly. And I never really heard his voice before. It wasn't audible, but it was very, very obvious. And he said, I've been doing so many good things for him. But they were all just religious works, like filthy rags, the Bible says. And I had never known him. And he said that to me very clearly. He said, you don't know me. Do you want to? And I'm pretty sure you can guess what the answer was. And my heart just opened up. And in that instant, the Holy Spirit filled me up with an incredible peace and joy that I had sung about so many times in church. I had read about so many times in the Scriptures but I had never, ever experienced that for myself. I'd never experienced what it meant to know and have an experience with Jesus, an experiential relationship. Have you had that? Do you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding? Do you have that joy? Do you have that hope? 
No, for me, finally, after 24 years, I experienced what it really was like to be in a relationship with God and have that peace and joy for myself. Because it was now Christ in me, the hope of glory. I knew that I would never, ever have to go to church again. I would never, ever have to read my Bible again. I'd never have to do any religious works again. And God would still be pleased with me. Isn't that amazing? Just think about that. Because of what Jesus did, you don't have to do anything and he's still pleased with you. However, when you know him, you want to do those things. You want to please him. You want to love him. You want to go and fellowship with people. You want to discover more of who he is and get into the Bible. You fall in love with the Bible because you fall in love with Jesus, who's the author. Now, don't get me wrong in everything I'm saying. Doing works for God, it's not a bad thing at all, as long as you're doing works because you know him and you love him. Maybe there's some of you here today and you know you're missing something. Maybe you've been coming to church your whole life or you called yourself a Christian, but have you really, really genuinely experienced Jesus for yourself? You may even know a lot of scripture, but do you know the author? If you don't, then I'd really encourage you to come and chat with Kevin or myself after the service. I'm sure Kevin would love to chat with you, definitely, and I would. But once we actually know Jesus, and I'm hoping and praying that most of you here do, then we all know that life gets really easy from then on, doesn't it? It gets a whole lot smoother, smooth sailing. Sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. No, okay, I'm getting some no's there and some uh, blank stares as well. Life is tough. We live in a fallen world. God has said, Jesus even said, you're going to go through trials. It's going to be hard. But I've overcome the world. And if you have me, you've got all you need. Do we believe that? When we truly know God for ourselves, I personally believe that we as Christians, though, can tend to drift in two different directions, okay? There's not a a whole lot of fence-sitting when it comes to these things we're about to talk about. We tend to approach knowing Jesus in one of two different ways. And this is something I really want to touch on because I know it's a struggle for many of us. I want to look at a passage of Scripture where we encounter two people who display these two different ways that we can approach life with Jesus. Hopefully, you can relate to at least one of these people in some way. So, let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42 is what we're going to go through today. Only a few verses, but I'd really love to nail these verses down and let's see what it's really saying. Okay, here's what it says. Now... As they were traveling along, this is Jesus and his disciples, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Let's just stop there for a second. In this verse, this very first verse, there's something very important that we need to look at. You know, we as believers, we we are called to show hospitality. We are called to show hospitality. We as the church are meant to be welcoming. This is a great way that we can help others experience Jesus for themselves and know him. And it's not just on a Sunday at church that we can welcome, but in every sphere of our lives. You know, in ancient Jewish culture, maybe some of you already know this, but it was extremely important, not just really important, extremely important to show hospitality and to welcome people into your home, even strangers. The truth is that many guests who were welcomed into homes weren't even family or friends. They were strangers. But for the Jews, welcoming them, in a way, was actually welcoming God. It was honouring God. 
What a great perspective to have. It was a really sacred thing. And back then, Jews, they would have also wanted to obey the command that God had actually set out for them in a book called Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 19, it says, When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And in Hebrews 13 too, it says, Do not neglect hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without even knowing it. So it's a big part of Jewish culture and it should be a part of our culture. The kingdom of God culture. So now with that kind of information that we've just been talking about, put yourself in Martha's shoes. She's a Jew, living in Jewish culture, very hospitable culture, extremely important to do it. So here we see Martha, and it's her own home, okay? She's doing something extremely important, especially considering Jesus was a rabbi, not to mention the Son of God. They probably didn't really understand that at the time, but he probably wasn't a stranger to her either. But nonetheless, she welcomed him in, and we can assume she was doing a pretty good job. She was going above and beyond, but... And this is where I say, but in the next verse in Luke 10, what do we see in verse 39? She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha, what does it say? Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? Anyone ever said that to God before? Do you not care? Do you not care that my sister has left me to do the serving by myself? Then tell her to help me. Seems a bit demanding, doesn't it? We'd never demand things from Jesus, would we? Remember here, Jewish culture of hospitality, and again, put yourself in Martha's shoes. She was doing a good thing. She was doing the expected thing from a cultural point of view and no doubt she wanted to please Jesus. The next verse says, But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried. In your Bibles, if you want to highlight that word, underline that word, you are worried and distracted highlight that word, by many things. But only one, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I don't know if you ever stopped to think about this for yourself, but um, maybe now's a good time to do this. Have you ever thought about what you would do if you had Jesus coming over for a meal, over to your house, what would be your main priority when you know that he's about to come through that front door? What would be your main priority even just preparing for his arrival? Think about that. Would you be cleaning every nook and cranny, making sure that it's spick and span? Would you be cramming all your junk and bits and leftovers, shoving them in a, a cupboard somewhere out of sight? Maybe the garage, maybe that's your storage place. Would you pretty up your garden and have some nice flowers? Beautify it all? What would you cook? What would you cook, Jesus, if he was coming over for a meal? What do you think Jesus would really like to eat? Would you go to the local bottle and find the most expensive bottle of wine? What other things would you do? I'm actually interested to hear from people. What, what things would you do in preparing for Jesus to come to your place? Shout it out. 
Get your heart right. Yep. What about preparing for Jesus? What would you do? You read the Bible? Prepare a sitting area. Okay. Cook him a roast. Roast pork. <laughs> roast pork. Hey, look, we know Jesus said that all foods are clean. Probably, that would probably be a good one. Roast pork. Look, I, I think what you guys were saying is great. Um, I don't know if everyone would sit in that view and perspective. I think if it came down to the crunch, many of us would be freaking out probably. We, we probably would want to clean. I mean, when we have our friends and family over, I'm assuming most of us would clean the house. I definitely would. I've got a one-year-old. Our house is always looking like a bomb's hit it. It's, it's really interesting to, to just think about how we can be so focused on those, those outward things when Jesus would most likely come into our house, wouldn't even see anything but you. He'd just want to be with you. He'd just want to hang out with you. Serving him is not a higher priority than being with him. Some of us need to hear that today. It's a bit of a tough pill to swallow, and I had to swallow that. My whole life was about serving, serving, serving. There's nothing wrong with serving. but I wasn't living life with him. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because Martha's heart was, was so focused on serving and ministering to Jesus. But I think Jesus' response is even more interesting and we need to pay attention to that. He knows that Martha, he knows that she's going through a lot of stuff in life. He knows her really, really well. Maybe the Father or the Holy Spirit has given her some knowledge there maybe a word of knowledge about what's going on in her life. But we know that he knows there's more going on than meets the eye. It's the same for you and for me. Everyone else might not see what's going on in your personal life. The things that you struggle with, the worries, the depression, all of the distractions, the hurt, the confusion, maybe not even your own family or friends or even your spouse really understands or sees it but he understands some of us need to know that he understands he sees he sees what's really going on and he sees what's really going on here with Martha and what does it say what does Jesus say to Martha Martha, get over yourself. Seriously, stop complaining. You've got, a, you've got a roof over your head. Martha, just stop. Is that what he says? No. In love, he points out what's really going on. We can take a lesson from him. He points out what's really going on. He doesn't beat around the bush. But he says, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. That doesn't sound like any of us today, does it? It doesn't relate to anyone here. Hey, you know, maybe you've been doing a lot of good stuff for God. You might even be serving him in many different ways. But has it taken you away from what he desires most?
Now, don't get me wrong. Like I said, serving God is a good thing, of course, but have you become so busy just doing the Christian life that you've forgotten the priority of just being with Jesus? Well, have you just gotten busy doing life in general? How's your calendar? How's your daily routine? Where does Jesus fit into that? And should he fit into that? Or should your life and my life fit around him? You know, when it comes to Martha, we, we see a heart where she really wants to please God. And we see the downside of her being distracted and worried But when it comes to Mary, the scripture doesn't really say much about Mary. Mary doesn't say anything, but one thing that we do know is she really, really likes to sit. Are you a server or a sitter? How often do you just take time to sit at Jesus' feet? Just be with him and listen. Anyone a good listener here? Not many. Hey, look, I'm there. You just ask my wife. She'll tell you. We, We find it very easy to pray to God and talk to him, but praying in relationship, if you just did that to your spouse or your your best friend or someone close to you, you just talk to them all the time. You ever have anyone in your life that does that? You never get a word in? (laughs) We do that to God all the time. When are we going to just take time to sit and listen? Because he's got a lot of things, a lot of good things that he wants to tell us. Maybe some of us need to Just let Jesus tell us how much he thinks of us. There's this guy called Leonard Ravenhill, and he has this really great quote. He says, to be much for God, we must be much with God. To be much for God, we must be much with God. You'll always, always make time for what's most important to you. You know, it's interesting to think that God, he's always present with us, right? We know that. But I think the question is, are we always present with him? To be present with God, it doesn't just mean we give him a chunk of time in our day but it's like being present in a conversation, in a relationship with your friends, your family, your spouse. You can be there but not be present. And I feel like a lot of us struggle with that. I know I do. Maybe that's an area where we need to grow. Being present with God, it's not even just being aware of Him on a Sunday morning when you get the goosebumps as you sing the songs. It's about keeping our spiritual ears open and being aware of Him every moment of the day. And that can happen anywhere, anytime, anyhow. He can speak to us. It's all good to just get alone with God and do that whenever you can. I'm encouraging that. And to sit at his feet, just like Mary, 
just be still and admire him and enjoy him and listen to him and tell him how great you think he is. And as disciples of Christ, knowing him means that we're in an experiential relationship where we're constantly being present with him. We're constantly in connection with him. In our culture and in our lives, we make it all about us. Probably most of the time unintentionally. What am I doing today? Maybe we need to ask God what he's doing. And how can we jump on board? Because that's going to be more fun. That's going to be more blessed. That's going to be more fruitful. So, the challenge for all of us who know him is this. Will we live worried, distracted, caught up in the things of this world, even if they're good things, or will we prioritise sitting at his feet Will we prioritise being present with him? Maybe, just maybe, our problems, our struggles might even disappear if we did. If you want that kind of relationship with Christ, if you want that renewing for some of you who have lost that intimacy, then I'm going to pray and I want you to stand with me and join me, because this is my prayer too, but it's my prayer for all of us. If you're struggling and want more of Him, then stand with me. If you're not in that right place with God, you know it, but you want to be. You want to be with Him. You don't, you, you, you're tired of just doing stuff, playing church, just doing good things all the time, and you just want Jesus. You just want to be with Him then why don't you stand with me and pr- as I pray? And after I pray, we're going to have a response time with a song. And in that song, you just let the Holy Spirit minister to you and do whatever you need to do. So let me pray. And you stand if you really just want that for yourself. Jesus, we just thank you so much that you have made a way where we could not make a way. No one could make the way. Thank you that you are the way. You have made it so easy for us that we don't have to do any good works anymore. We don't have to try hard anymore. We don't have to try to please you anymore. You are pleased with us and the Father is pleased with us because of your sacrifice. We thank you so much for your love and I pray that you would renew us in that love. And we just want to say sorry for pursuing the things that take our mind away from you, our heart away from you, our time away from you. We're sorry for the worries and distractions. We're sorry for just getting so caught up in daily routines Even the good stuff, like reading our Bibles, coming to church. Would you take us deeper now and touch us, that we may experience your intimacy, your love, your grace, your joy, your peace. And for those of us who are particularly struggling with the worries in this world and the things that don't really matter, Would you set those people free and break those chains off them right now? By your love. Would we live out of that relationship with you? And would you get us excited, Jesus? Excited. Excited for you, passionate for you, wanting to sit with you, be present with you in every moment.
that we can be effective disciples in this world because people don't want to see busy body Christians. They want to see people who love you and love one another and that's how we're going to change this world. We thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll play that song. Thank you. Just look up, your help is on the way.